All right. A very good evening to all and a hearty welcome as we set out to launch one of the most awaited academic books of this year. I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome our esteemed participants and guests to join the event, which marks the first of its kind panel discussion. As a leader in academic publishing, Pearson's successful track record stands testimony to an unparalleled delivery of the best products in academic learning, especially in the higher education sphere. Today's event holds tremendous significance for us as we unveil the Indian edition of Psychology 6th edition by Dr. Sandra K. Cicerelli, Dr. Nolan Bide, and Dr. Girishwar Mishra. Lip Labeled as the indispensable textbook for students of psychology, this is one of the best sellers and in all terms has the finest content with relevance in recent times across the globe. But the story of the book began with Dr. Cicerelli's initiation and efforts in putting together the text based on research for facilitating students learning. Dr. Cicerelli is a professor emeritus of psychology at Gulf Coast State College in Panama City, Florida. She has been associated with Gulf Coast State College as a professor of psychology, where she taught introductory psychology and human development for more than 30 years. A PhD in developmental psychology from George Peabody College of Vanderbilt University, Nashville, Tennessee. She is a member of the American Psychological Association and the Association for Psychological Science. Dr. Cicerelli also co-authored numerous ancillary materials for several introductory psychology and human development content. Let us hear what she has to say about the pedagogy involved and the journey of this book. Hello. I'm Dr. Sandra Cicerelli, Sandy to my friends, and I am a professor emeritus at Gulf Coast State College here in the United States. Uh, I'm the original author of the textbook that you are all discussing today, uh, along with uh, Dr. J. Nolan White, who's been my uh, co-author and friend and good right hand uh, since the second edition of the book. Uh, they've asked me to give you a brief uh, discussion of the story of the book, how I came to write the textbook. It all started uh, after about 20 years of teaching. I had gotten frustrated with students that I knew were intelligent and that could uh, do well in school, but tended not to read the textbook. And when I asked them why, they said, the textbook is so dry and it just presents information and and it's hard to read and I read for so long and then I just get bored and, and so I just don't bother to read. So of course they come to class and they're not prepared and they're not getting as much out of the lecture so they're not going to do as well as I knew they could. So I decided that I needed to write, try to write a book that would engage students, that would make them want to read their textbook and keep reading it so that they would be able to come to class prepared. So my students told me that they found textbooks to be kind of dry and boring and difficult to read because they would just present concept after concept after concept. And it was hard to relate to those concepts in their daily lives. But they would tell me that they enjoyed my lectures and what they really enjoyed was how I told a lot of stories, examples from my life, examples from the lives of my colleagues and my students that uh, would help bring those concepts in psychology to life. Uh, they also liked that I didn't just lecture straight, I would ask them questions. I would pause and stop and wait for them to ask me questions and then answer those questions and use those questions as stepping stone to the next part of the lecture because usually they were going right along with where I wanted to go in that particular day's lecture. So I decided to incorporate those things in the textbook itself. And that's why you find that there are, there's a conversational tone to the book without being, uh, as we would say here, dumbed down, uh, not as uh, 
rigorous in terms of academics. I didn't want to sacrifice any academic rigor, but I wanted students to be able to understand what they were reading. So uh, many times I would stop and explain things in a little more plain language in the textbook. You'd see words that uh, I found my students are having difficulty with, which were surprisingly not the more difficult psychology terms, but just ordinary English terms. Uh, and, and I would put those, uh, excuse me, as uh, vocabulary terms at the bottom of each page those words appeared on to try to help them along. The same thing for some kinds of idioms that students who are not n native uh, to the United States would be able to understand. In fact, sometimes not even native to the region of the states from which I am. So I had those kinds of concepts. Uh, I included what we call the student voice questions as a way of making the text chapters a dialogue between the writer, the professor, and the students reading the textbook, just as I did in my classes. So that's why you see those questions, which are real questions from my students over the years uh, that they have asked as we were going through those concepts in lectures. Uh, the uh, examples, uh, those are key, very important, and that is where uh, Dr. Misra, and I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, and uh, others who add cultural content to the book are so very important because I can include stories from my background and my culture, but it's very, very important to have stories from the culture in which the book is being used. Very important. So I am very thankful to you, Dr. Misra, and all of those who have worked on the book with you for doing that. Uh, obviously, there's uh, other things like critical thinking questions and exercises uh, throughout the book because, of course, as we know, our students uh, and many, many people in the world today are not good at critical thinking, and we need to promote that whenever we can. So we tried to include Noland and I critical thinking questions whenever we could. There are even critical thinking questions as captions to some of the pictures and illustrations. Uh, just to keep students thinking and, and asking themselves questions and answering questions as they go along. There are the practice quizzes uh, at certain, within certain sections of the textbook and the end of chapter tests, which serve two purposes. It keeps them engaged in what's going on, helps them stop and assess themselves before they get too far, makes them stop and take a break from reading and let me see how much I understand so far, uh, and I found that students won't do that if they have to stop reading the textbook and go find a student study guide or some other resource as well as if it's right there in the book. So there they have a kind of mini study guide right there in the book that I think helps. So that's really the story of the book. I wanted to help students uh, be motivated to read, want to read the book and want to read the book before they came to class so that they could engage in the classroom conversation and dialogue a, a little more uh, intelligently and uh, get a lot more out of that classroom lecture. So that's it. I felt pretty good about my goals for the textbook when I had students from my classes as well as students from uh, classes all over the United States and from other countries including India write me letters and tell me how much they enjoyed the book, that the textbook helped them and was so much more interesting to read than many of their other traditional textbooks. So I think I've done my job and I thank you all for the work that you have done on uh, the book and I thank you, especially my colleague Nolan and Dr. Misra, and I wish you all good luck in the conference today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sisreli, especially for, the be for beautifully explaining the idea of the book and how it was conceived and conceptualized. And I'm sure students will definitely be benefited with this text. Now let us call upon Dr. Nolan Bai to briefly talk about the sixth edition of psychology, but not before we tell you about his illustrious career graph. Dr. White is a professor of psychology at Georgia College and State University.
a PhD in counseling psychology from the University of Tennessee. His area of teaching expertise is introductory psychology, psychology of adjustment, behavioral neuroscience, counseling, and clinical psychology, senior seminar, and a section of advanced research methods focusing on psychophysiology. What's interesting is Dr. White's research approach in teaching. He has an active lab and with his students, he continues to investigate the psychophysiological characteristics and neuropsychological performance of adults with and without ADHD. Outside the lab, Dr. White is engaged in collaborative research, examining the effectiveness of incorporating various technologies in and out of the college classroom to facilitate student learning. In April 2008, he was a recipient of the Georgia College Excellence in Teaching Award. And that's not all. As a psychologist, he has worked with adolescents and adults in a variety of clinical and community settings. I'm sure everybody wants to listen to you. So over to you, Dr. White. <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate that introduction. Um, Again, like Sandy said, I'd like to thank Dr. Mishra and all the contributors for what they've added to this text with the Indian edition of Psychology 6E. It really is amazing to see everything that's been added and just the contextual information and the deepening, hopefully that will facilitate better student understanding of all the concepts that have been added. As Sandy said, this has been a book. Um, I've been involved with Sandy ever since the second edition. and I used the first edition of the text in my own classes, and I found that Sandy's writing style and the way the book was structured really matched how I like to work with my students. I'm very fortunate. I have relatively small classes. My largest class is typically about 40 students, but as best as I can, I like to have a conversation with my students as best as you can with 40 people in the room. And the only way that you can have that conversation <clears throat> and have that discussion is if we are coming from a similar point of reference. And that point of reference is a textbook. And as Sandy said, I've used a variety of textbooks over the years, and it was always a struggle to get students to read. And so what I found about Sandy's book was it really engaged the reader in a dialogue, much like what I wanted to accomplish in the classroom. And by using Sandy's book, and luckily, uh, I got to go to a um, review meeting and I actually got to meet Sandy and a lot of members of the Pearson team. And I was really um, struck several months later when I got a phone call um, if I wanted to join Sandy on the textbook. And I've been working with her ever since. And that's truly been uh, very fortunate and truly a blessing to do so. But what's really been great um, by working with Sandy is that we've been able to incorporate the science of learning um, as Sandy described, no, the practice quizzes that are distributed throughout the chapter. Those are intended to help students engage in that formative assessment when they have the end of chapter assessment so they can engage in a summative assessment of what they're understanding, hopefully far in advance before any in class or other exams that they may have. But really helping students, I hope, to be able to see the science of psychology, that it's based on data, that it is inherently tied to culture and context, and that some of the history of psychology was very restricted in who was studied, but we are learning so much more now of being able to incorporate culture and understand how psychology affects us all and how context is so important in that understanding. And what I hope students can walk away with is learning how psychology affects them in their everyday life and hopefully learning something that can affect them for the rest of their lives. So. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today with the rest of the panel. Thank you, Dr. White. This is really insightful to know, you know, the hard work that has gone into the book from your end. Now coming to the Indian edition of the book, it offers significant examples based on researches made by Indian scholars and practitioners of psychology. The book has been designed and presented to guide students as new entrants to the discipline of psychology. New Indian cases and perspectives have been added to draw students into the discipline by quoting real life examples on how psychology relates to their own lives. <clears throat> Let us hear about the Indian edition from the author himself, who is one of the most revered professors of psychology in India, Dr. Girishwar Mishra. 
Dr. Mishra is the ex vice chancellor of Mahatma Gandhi Antarashtriya Hindi Vishwa Vidyalaya Varda in Maharashtra. His academic journey spans over five decades, with, which includes his role as a professor of psychology at the University of Delhi for over 20 years. Dr. Mishra has been a Fulbright Senior Fellow at University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, and Swarthmore College, Philadelphia. He was also visiting professor at the Ruhr University, Germany, an ESRC Fellow at Sussex University, UK, and a Fulbright Nehru Lecturer at New School of Social Research, New York. He was also the chief editor of the fifth and sixth survey of psychology, a council member and national fellow of the Indian Council for Social Science Research, a recipient of the Jawaharlal Nehru National Award by the government of Madhya Pradesh and fellow of National Academy of Psychology in India, Dr. Mishra's research interests focus on social development, social developmental and cultural psychology. His major publications include Psychological Consequences of Prolonged Dep Deprivation, Applied Social Psychology in India, New Directions in Indian Psychology, Social Psychology, Rethinking Intelligence, Human Competence in Cultural Context, and the list is really, really long. So without much ado, Dr. Mishra, the mic is yours. Thank you, Anandita. Uh, first of all, I would like to extend welcome to all the colleagues who have uh, joined this meeting. I am very grateful to Dr. White and uh, Dr. Cisrelli who have put a wonderful textbook for psychology students. The text that has been designed to provide a perspective on the different facets of psychological science. As teachers in Indian universities, we have been looking at the material which is presented and we found that we are quite uh, unfamiliar with many things which are there and we are not going to relate the various psychological theories, concepts to the cultural context. Let me very briefly mention that the official narrative of psychology has been very close to a model of science which is uh, primarily positivist in its structure. And gradually it has been noted that the relationship between culture and psychology is very significant. Somehow or other, the textbooks often forget this very important aspect of life. In order to apply the different principles of psychology, we need to take care of the cultural context. But cultural context is not merely a context for application. The culture also works as a source for knowledge. Uh, it's uh, important to realize that the Euro-American psychology which has provided a lot of input for the development of psychology provides one kind of perspective and we need to bring the various facets of life which are present in different cultural contexts. So when we were the students, our textbooks hardly referred to any Indian material, any Indian conceptual foundation, and it was a real problem. Now, what we have done in this Indian edition is to relate psychology with cultural context in a serious manner. For instance, 
we have looked at how culture and psychology relate, how psychology has grown as a science and what are its various facets. In addition to that, we have also incorporated different kinds of methodological developments that are taking place, including qualitative methods. I think it is very important to note that there are many areas where Indian categories, concepts have a lot to contribute. For instance, if you look at the psychology of emotion or intelligence or the area of human development and health, there are important conceptual developments which can enrich the discourse in psychology. So psychology is related to culture in two ways, in very brief um, introduction to this whole gamut of knowledge, which has grown in recent years, we have learned that culture also contributes to conceptual and theoretical aspects of psychology and also becomes a very important aspect uh, of, of, of the professional life of a psychologist because you need to relate to the specific cultural contexts. So this addition of psychology is really trying to bridge uh, this gap and provide uh, a textbook which can facilitate learning of psychological science and enrich the understanding of psychological processes and relating it to the real life context. I hope that the deliberation in today's uh, uh, webinar is going to help to create an awareness about the different aspects of life in contemporary context. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Mishra. I think these are like words of wisdom coming from you and not just students, I think even future authors and professors will get inspired uh, by the text that you've put in there. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we present to you the first look of the book. I request Dr. White and Dr. Mishra to kindly unveil the book and hold it in front of the camera. And can we have the video, please, Amit? Yeah. Thank My you. background's messing it up. <laughs> <laughs> Hemant, can we have the video, please?
wow, this is quite a moment. And thank you authors for unveiling the book. So now moving to the next section of today's event, the much awaited panel discussion on psychology and contemporary challenges, cultural perspectives. Let's open the forum for discussion. And Dr. White, I would like to start with you. Cultural perspectives and its imposition has always seemingly been a challenge to psychology. Uh, please enlighten us with examples from the Western world. I think some of the most recent examples, whether it be where students are getting their information from, such as which outlet for news, whether it be through social media, whether it be through uh, personal exchange, now, the, at least for the U.S., we've had a lot of political turmoil. We've had um, different conflicts. We've had you know, a global epidemic that's affected everybody across the world. And I think that helping students see that the science behind whatever is going on, how psychology can apply. You know, why would somebody have an opinion on something like COVID, whether or not someone chose to uh, protect themselves or whether they saw the vaccination. How do people treat one another? Um, in the US, we have laws that are being overturned and how we have groups that are going against one another. But stopping and listening to the perspective of another person, you know, I might not ever be able to fully understand someone's unique experience, but it doesn't mean that I can't try and it can't mean that I can't try to understand that somebody's experience of the world is different than my own. And that's one of the things I think psychology can offer students is understanding that each of us have a unique perspective and that by using the tools that psychology gives us based on science, then hopefully we can better interact with each other and better interact with our world overall. Well, those are some really interesting observations uh, coming from you. Dr. Mishra, can you provide the Indian perspective to it? Uh, I understand that uh, the life is organized with notions of self and relationships. And I would like to bring here the way human life is organized in the Indian context. The notion of self has become a very important feature of psychological discourse in recent years. The phrase of individualism and collectivism or interdependent and dependent self have become very popular. So how you think about yourself and how you relate to others provides a, a kind of a framework within which you work, the way you relate to others. So an independent way of thinking about self and an interdependent way of thinking about self is going to create a perspective on emotion, on motivation, on how we perform in a group situation. In our current edition of the book, we have included the understanding of pro-social behavior, how adolescents, adults, and the aged people carry out the various responsibilities and perform. We have also tried to look at what are the psychological facets of interaction and uh, health outcomes in the context of COVID? We have brought that also in our textbook. We have also looked at the way emotions in the context of uh, Indian theory of rasas, which is a very, very uh, rich uh, repertoire of uh, you know, analysis of emotional expressions and dramaturgy and other things. So we have tried to bring that into account. I must mention here that 
the key areas of life, including love, which, which becomes a very important uh, task in life, has a perspective which is not universal, which has certain elements which are culture specific. Uh, there are many ways in which health is uh, looked at, healing is looked at. Uh, I will mention here at least two important contributions which are receiving attention worldwide, the contribution of yoga and meditation. The healing practices which are available and they, they involve certain ways of self-regulation. So this edition of uh, psychology, the sixth edition, which we are talking about, provides ways to relate to cultural specific developments and they also uh, try to bring home the point that there are certain uh, conceptual innovations which have global implication. So uh, one of our colleagues have mentioned that psychology has to be global. It has to address uh, global developments and has also related to the local cultural contexts. So I look forward to the engagement of faculty and students with this kind of uh, interface. I would like to mention it because uh, psychology is not merely a biologically driven you know, science. It, it has a very important core, which is cultural. So we participate uh, in different spheres of life within a cultural context. Of course, culture is not static, it is dynamic, it grows, it changes, and there is cultural contact, particularly in the era of globalization. So we look forward to this kind of understanding which provides scope to acknowledge the role of cultural context in building our understanding of psychological processes. I will stop here and I hope that other colleagues will bring home the different facets of uh, life and how psychology can benefit from uh, our learning in different cultural contexts. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Mishra. It's always amazing to listen to you. And especially now that we have insightful comparatives and given the health and, uh, you know, uh, healing that we have mentioned, I think both worlds needed that post this pandemic situation. So moving on, now let us welcome our four other esteemed panelists, Dr. Shagufa Kapadia from the MS University, Baroda in Gujarat. Dr. Rekha Singhal from Sri Sri University, Katak in Odisha, Dr. Kumar Ravipriya from IIT Kanpur in Uttar Pradesh, and also joining the discussion from Bangalore is Director Human Resources for Pearson India, Ms. Ritu Agas. To add to the discussion started by Dr. White and Dr. Mishra, I invite Dr. Kumar Ravipriya to speak on the topic. Dr. Kumar is a professor of psychology at the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences at the Institute of Technology, Kanpur. He is a Fulbright Nehru Academic and Professional Fellowship Awardee in 2017 and 18 at Connecticut College, New London in the US. His research interests are in the areas of qualitative research, disaster, mental health, alternative paradigms of psychology, and cultural psychology. Dr. Kumar has also co-authored many textbooks and contributed numerous scholarly articles in various journals, including the APA Journal of Theoretical and Philosophical Psychology. Dr. Kumar, in the light of this discussion, please take us back into history to understand how the past events have their influence on psychology of today. Okay, thank you so much, Nindita. So first of all, I would like to congratulate all the authors, Professor Mishra, Professor White, and also Sandy. Um, uh, we have all listened to the remarkable contributions that 
the authors have made to uh, make psychology relatable to everyday life. And that to me is one of the most significant achievements of this particular book. Um, uh, I would also like to briefly mention that uh, uh, the book also took me back to my undergraduate days. And I was dreaming that, you know, had it been, you know, a textbook of this kind uh, during our undergraduate days, it might have been really, really wonderful, particularly for uh, one important reason that all the authors pointed out, uh, which is to try and see that how uh, uh, the relational, cultural, as well as social histor historical context shape our lives. So for an undergraduate student, simply getting into, let us say, the psychophysical, uh, you know, psychophysics, uh, you know, theories or other um, uh, theories which take us towards understanding human behavior and emotions and experiences, it would be extremely difficult for uh, student, undergraduate student, um, uh, who is uh, trying to uh, make sense of uh, not only psychology as a subject, but also um, what is happening in everyday life. And as Nolan pointed out that worldwide, whether it is United States or India, there are multiple things that are happening to what we understand as context or culture. So from that point of view, I think uh, the book speaks to the heart and soul of all the undergraduate student, because I could, you know, uh, it, it took me back to my own undergraduate days. <laughs> Okay, so particularly your question related to the history of uh, uh, psychology and how past events have shaped this. I just have one brief comment to make here. Uh, the book also is, uh, I mean, uh, quite historic in the sense that uh, the upcoming of this book, advent of this book is very historic because uh, it also coincides with uh, almost 50 years of uh, Ken Gergen's contribution, which has contributed in a big way to the debates around theories and uh, concepts in psychology and his article, Social Psychology as History. So that was the time, 1973, and uh, Professor Mishra and many other colleagues in psychology, I mean, particularly Professor Mishra and uh, other eminent psychologists who we have heard, uh, there has been this attempt to try and develop something which can Gergen called uh, reflexive challenge which all the authors today pointed out that how it is critical to try and understand that uh, the concepts and theories in psychology come from somewhere. These do not happen in vacuum. So the whole subject matter of psychology came from the historical developments uh, of uh, the past century and this century. And particularly the 1960s was very, very critical in terms of bringing home the important point that how uh, you know, the, the cultural as well as sociopolitical uh, context of knowledge development matters so much. And that's where Ken Gergen's contribution comes up. So reflexive challenge is all about, as uh, Ken Gergen uh, mentions, to try and understand that how theories have their own underpinnings in the social historical context. And that's where I would say that uh, it also takes us towards uh, the openness towards multiple theories, perspectives, whether it is Indian or indigenous perspectives and methodologies. And so from that point of view, I would say that, yes, uh, I mean, it definitely, definitely coincides with the social constructions movement that began way back in 1970s. And today we find this book as uh, more or less as a culmination of multiple, uh, I would say, efforts that have been made by various psychologists who have been open to do uh, the kind of uh, science which relates to people, which speaks to, uh, you know, people living in diverse circumstances, people of diverse phases of life, whether it's undergraduate students or, uh, you know, people like us who are in their middle ages and all. Um, and at the same time, as uh, all of us pointed out, and Professor Mishra also mentioned about, Nolan also mentioned about healing. It also speaks to variety of crises and uh, you know uh, problems that human race, human society has faced, including the pandemic. So, what could be better? You know that uh, it speaks to the book. The, the book speaks to a variety of audiences, and uh, it it makes uh, you know it relatable to anybody who would like to read it, not just psychology students. So, thank you so much, Professor Mishra, Professor White, and Sandy for 
bringing up you know this uh, wonderful uh, remarkable volume thank you so much thank you dr kumar so continuing with the discussion i call upon dr rekha singhal who is the dean of faculty of contemplating and behavioral sciences at shri shri university in katak odisha Dr. Singhal was previously associated with Indian Institute of Management, Ranchi. Her area of teaching is applied social psychology and research methods. Dr. Singhal is a 1999 postdoctoral fellowship awardee by Wageningen University in the Netherlands. She has initiated various research programs sponsored by UNICEF, UNDP, World Bank, Ford Foundation, and many state governments in India. So, Dr. Singhal. as a co as core to the discussion is the contemporary challenges what are your observations regarding the present scenario of cultural perspectives and the challenges they pose uh, thank you anandita for giving me this opportunity to speak and joining this gathering and interacting with the authors whom we have been admiring seeing as a role model and guiding us always so first of all let me congratulate the three authors dr sisrali dr white and professor mishra um and you have asked me to address the issue of contem contemporary issues related to the psychology uh you have mentioned that my department is known as a department of behavioral and contemplative studies and yes um so for us this book is not going to be useful for the students only or for the faculty because we have been struggling always the contemplative studies or indian perspective was always treated as a separate as if they are two in fact if you interact with many of the students they'll say eastern psychology and western psychology and the indian perspective they call as a eastern psychology and when i went through the book amazing amazing the way it integrates both there's no need to say eastern psychology or western psychology rather it provides the cultural perspective of psychology and which is contextually and uh, contextually and culturally sensitive perspective this is going to provide future pathways and furthering psychology as well as human values uh, the another thing which i want to mention in terms of uh, contemporary issues uh, probably i won't be wrong if i say there won't be any any book of psychology which will have chapter on consciousness and this is the only book which has separate chapter on consciousness similarly starting from the first chapter to the last starting from the introduction to psychology it talks about the indian perspective in terms of contribution in vedas yoga smritis mahabharat gita which is always taken as a separate but the way it integrates and when i went through the chapter i myself got a confidence that let's stop using the word western psychology and eastern psychology it's a psychology which provides to understand which helps us to understand human behavior in a cultural and social context and western and eastern together makes it complete understanding and that's the beauty of this course and the another thing i want to mention that psychology as a subject has not always been source of attraction or learning for the students or and teachers even the people in the society for neither student of psychology nor affiliated formally as a teacher of psychology when you we interact with them they say oh you are in the psychology suggest me some book i want to study psychology and apply in my daily life and whenever i recommended the books they come back to me and they'll say ma'am it has a lot of concepts and theories but i am not finding it is helping me 
I'm not doing masters or graduation in psychology. And now we got the solution through this book, which relates to us, which provides cross-cultural context and which integrates so beautifully, not only the concept, not only the theories, application, social and cultural context and importance of self and self-regulation. So indeed, uh, the book is going to be helpful, not only to the students, not only the, to the teachers, but to the common people who, who want to use psychology in day-to-day -day life. And psychology will become, this book will help to make the psychology as a proactive and preemptive and application-oriented psychology, taking psychology beyond the classroom in and around our lives, in family, society, even in the public policy making. So I find this book is going to be useful for every, everyone, who, and nobody is going to leave the book in between. So I'm really happy to be part of this release of the book. And I'm so happy that, yes, I've got something on which I can rely on rather than searching bits and parts from here and there. And psychology is psychology. It is in cultural and social context with the human values. So thank you, Anindita and Pearson for making me part of this. And really, really honored and humbled to be part of this. August gathering. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Excellently put by you. Actually, the book um, ends the divide of this Eastern and Western psychology. And like Dr. Kumar had also mentioned that it, it uh, you know, the book is really indispensable in understanding, you know, the concepts in psychology. Uh, so moving on to our next panelist, Dr. Shagufa Kapadia. Dr. Kapadia is a professor in the Department of Human Development and Fam Family Studies at the MS University of Baroda. Her research specialization include cultural issues in human development with focus on adolescence and emerging childhood, uh, adulthood, self, morality, parenting, and socialization, including gender and women's issues. Besides being a renowned author herself, Dr. Kapadia is on the review and editorial boards of the Journals of Psychological Studies and Culture and Psychology. Professor Kapadia has been a recipient of the Fulbright Senior Research Fellowship and the Shastri Indo-Canadian Faculty Research Award. She is a fellow of the National Association of Psychology India and the South Asian region representative of the International Association of Cross-Cultural Psychology. Dr. Kapadia, given your expertise and you know, extensive research-oriented understanding, how do you see these challenges going forward? Yeah, uh, thank you so much, Anandita. Um, and uh, um, congratulations once again to the authors and to Pearson for bringing out this one-of-a-kind book uh, of psychology. And to echo one of the previous speakers, I wish I were a student uh, and uh, wanting to study psychology and human development all over again. Um, you know, one of the important learnings that this book presents is that diversity is at the core of life and living. And um, it, uh, I would like to invoke a quote by Albert Einstein. Um, and it's as follows that everybody is a genius. But if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing that it is stupid. So uh, I would like to focus a little bit on diversity because this book brings that out so very well. And, uh, you know, we hear a lot about the importance of biodiversity and its role in maintaining the balance of our planet. And undoubtedly, that is so significant. However, a growing school of evolutionary biology now believes that the fact that the human race has survived across immense diversity of habitats did not depend essentially only on specific genetic adaptations, but on culturally transmitted knowledge, abilities, and skills that are passed on from one generation to the next. Um, so in simple words, cultural diversity is essential for the survival of human species. Uh, and we just heard how culture and psychology um, are so interlinked. They share four elements of thoughts, beliefs, values, and behaviors, which vary across cultures. And hence, culture and cultural diversity are sine qua non in the study of psychology. 
Um, so really, as the book brings out so very well, in order to fully understand human psychology, we need to explore and understand how the mind is structured and how it functions in different cultural and socio-demographic contexts. Um, so uh, also that, uh, you know, what the, the other thing that this book brings out is that, you know, doing psychology in diverse cultural contexts can be such a stimulating enterprise because it presents immense potential to discover concepts and ways of thinking that, that may be largely unfamiliar or perhaps even unimaginable in one society and yet are so naturally integrated in other cultures. So uh, imagine what such endeavors bring to the table as already outlined by Professor Mishra, you know, we have, I mean, psychology as a field is now richer and wiser in its repertoire of conceptual understanding of several core concepts like the self, identity, morality, um, many of these have been outlined in the book and uh, also uh, research that is culturally grounded is showing us that even very basic principles of how to do research um, uh, are also culturally influenced. So, you know, uh, as students of psychology or scholars of psychology, you know, we, uh, we always need to deal with uh, ethical issues and concerns when we are doing research. And, um, you know, there's much writing now that, uh, you know, scholars are putting forth, uh, you know, to emphasize that even ethical issues are uh, very culturally determined. So, for example, notions of privacy and confidentiality, uh, you know, they play out so differently in different contexts. So, for example, in a typical Indian household, especially in rural settings and low resource communities, you know, the house is generally open to neighbors, friends, relatives. So people walk in and out without knocking on the door. So access is not as difficult for the researcher. In fact, she or he may be treated with much hospitality. And at the same time, there is another side to it that... Uh, it can become rather difficult to find time alone for an individual interview, especially if the participant is an adolescent girl or a woman, because it's a common practice in, in our culture for the elders to sit around out of curiosity or as a mark of protection or even to monitor what is being asked and answered. So how does one maintain confidentiality in such a situation? Um, similarly, just one other small example, you know, this whole business of written consent is also something that's not so viable in all cultures, especially those that have the tradition of oral communication. Uh, and uh, even if the person is an adult, very often the decision to participate in a study is often a collective process. So, you know, there are lots of examples, uh, you know, in this book, and I think that makes it so much richer and exciting to read for the student as well. And uh, such insights that are presented in the book uh, only serve to enhance our understanding of this wide range of human diversity and broaden our spectrum of what is normal, thereby allowing people to explore and tap their unique potential for being and doing. And finally, and uh, most important, uh, it will also enable us to better understand and engage with others, thereby recognizing and reducing biases and encouraging an inclusive and interconnected spirit of humankind, which is greatly needed in the world today. So thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Kapadia. Indeed, insightful, and I will pick on uh, you know take away from your this thing is you know evolution of this culture sensitiveness. I would say is very important in the context of understanding human psychology today. Now, moving to someone whose expertise in people skills comes from a years of experience in dealing with psychology at workplace, bases the culture cultural diversity of employees in organizations in India. She is the Director of Human Resources at Pearson India, Ms. Ritu Agast. Ms. Agast is a Master's of Arts in Clinical Psychology from Mumbai University and has over 24 years of work experience in leadership roles of HR across sectors like Fullerton, Infosys, Hindustan, and Hindustan Unilever, and many more. She is a certified coach from International Coach Federation, and her areas of expertise are culture building, organizational design, change management, executive coaching and leadership development, talent assessments and development, HR process, uh, processes designing and implementation, performance management and employee engagement. Ritu, welcome again. So tell us from your expertise and experience how you see contemporary challenges of psychology versus the cultural diversity at workplace. Uh, 
unmute. Uh, I think you can unmute yourself. We can't hear, uh, just unmute your mic, I guess. Um, uh, no, no, we can't. Uh, Hemant, can you please check what? Himan, could you please check Ritu's mic once? Yeah, check it. Just give me a second. I think it's I it's think uh, an interesting conversation we've already put together, you know, with all the insights that, that is coming from stalwarts, you know, in the field of psychology. So we'll just wait for a couple of seconds to check uh, uh, Ritu's audio situation. Uh, can you unmute now, Ritu? Okay, by the time Ritu joins us, any one of you would like to, uh, I would request any of the panelists to add to the discussion that you feel. Um, Here is one thing I've I was thinking about the conversation referring to Eastern versus Western psychology. There, there is, as Syria is talking to me, there's another idea in psychology that came about also in the 70s and a little bit later on about positive psychology. And although there's a wonderful influence of health and well-being, you know, because some students can come out of psychology thinking it's all about pathology or looking at what are some of the, the downsides of the human experience. So the idea of positive psychology that we focus on health and well-being and those things that help us flourish. Well, although I embrace those ideas, one of the things that I like students to come out of the class thinking about is that uh, just with the comment about Western versus Eastern, I don't want them thinking that there's just a positive psychology and a side of psychology that's not. All of it is psychology. All of it affects us as humans. So I really appreciate the comment. It's not about East versus West. It's about psychology helping all of us as individuals and not only uh, for ourselves, but how we interact with those around us and those that we come in contact with. Thank you, Dr. White. I think, yes, truth is, you know, very aptly put. I mean, there's, there's just psychology and there's no Western and Eastern. The divide is not there. And the book brings it out very well. Uh, I think, uh, Ritu, I think we can now listen to your, uh, yes, okay. listen to you now. No, no, we cannot. Oh. Oh, we so wanted your perspective on this, you know. Uh, all right. Uh, so I'll move on for now. Uh, of course, Ritu, <laughs> we have so much. I think just check. Let's... Huh. I think by the time she joins, I think just check it. Ritu. And you know, Dr. White, like you have said, the divide is not just in the context of psychology. I think it's in the human behavior also. We're becoming very culture sensitive, you know, trying to understand the various cultures uh, that we can relate to and how they influence, uh, you know, the behavior. So. Right, so, all right, uh, we'll move on. Ritu, can we try once more? Uh, oh. 
All right, I'm extremely sorry for that. Okay, so uh, I think we have some interesting insights, but anyways, uh, we'll just move on. With that, uh, I think we're almost uh, to the end. And Dr. Mishra, I would like uh, to request you to sum up the discussion in some you know, quick points, two, three points as takeaways for today, if you could kindly. The kind of conversation that has proceeded in this uh, webinar has many interesting insights. Uh, we appreciate that there is a move to have acknowledgement of cultural contribution towards the growth of psychology at conceptual level, methodological level, and at the level of application. I think this is a very important uh, aspect of uh, a development that is taking place. We have cross-cultural psychology as a, as a major initiator. We have another uh, domain that has come up uh, with a more focus on cultural psychology and indigenous psychology. At the same time, we see that the uh, developments in uh, neuroscience uh, is offering certain avenues to look at reality at another level. Uh, I, I worry uh, that the, the kind of, uh, you see, uh, reductionism that takes place is quite problematic that you go to a lower level and explain with that. So in order to have a comprehensive perspective, we need to see how the developments in neurosciences and also developments in cultural studies and also how the social, political and economic changes that are taking place are converging and how they are contributing to life. It's, it's important to recognize that. Uh, there are many issues which are uh, present in today's world. Um, the, the, the book has possibility to explore even those aspects. We, we need to look at the problem of violence, which is coming up in a big way. I think we need to uh, seriously think about the ways how that can be reduced. We, we see about, uh, you know, uh, the, the developments in terms of racial prejudices in certain um, parts of this planet. We also uh, need to bother about the climate change and uh, what is going to happen to this planet and, and the well-being. Uh, I, I would like to submit here that psychology is predominantly anthropocentric. It's, it's a human being which is uh, at the center and we look at the reality from that perspective. We, we need to broaden it. We need to look at biological, ecological, and psychological. All the three facets are very, very uh, important. Uh, unless we achieve that kind of perspective, <coughs> bio, eco, psychological, we, we will fall short in our efforts to appreciate the complexity of reality. Uh, then there is another very important point, uh, as uh, uh, Ravi Priya has uh, mentioned that uh, there is transformation in psychological knowledge taking place at different points of time. And we look forward to that. So psychology has to prepare uh, itself to, to meet the contemporary uh, challenges and also to see about the future. Farming future is also very crucial. So I look forward to the engagement of colleagues and the students, and I'm sure the effort which has been put uh, into preparation of uh, this textbook provides certain ways to understand our problems and challenges uh, more effectively, but there is a scope for uh, improvement and development and look forward to 
the feedback from colleagues and students and to make it richer. So let us engage with psychology more effectively and make it a, a kind of a sincere engagement with life and how to make life better. Uh, in Indian context, we often talk about Sat, Chit, and Ananda. Uh, there is reality and there is beauty and also it has positivity. Um, it's, it's a beautiful idea that our existence itself has these three facets. And um, as a final comment, I would like to make it uh, clear that uh, positive psychology has grown, but again, somehow or other, it is more individualistic in its orientation. We, we need to go beyond that. And we relate to others, including the ecology. I thank all the colleagues who have joined this meeting. Uh, and I'm grateful to Pearson for uh, providing this platform to, to discuss some of the contemporary issues which are faced by humanity and how psychology can engage with this. So with these words, I uh, again specifically thank all the uh, colleagues who have participated in this debate. Thanks. So Dr. Dr. Bishra, I, I finally I found my voice. Oh, so great, I, great, I, great. I, so I, you will have the I last word. It. <laughs> Thank you, Ritu. Thank Welcome. you, Dr. Vishal. Welcome to the board. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so yeah. thank you. Now that I found my voice, I can do my thank you as well. Um, right. Dr. White and Dr. Mishra, you can't imagine what music it sounded to my ears when you said the word psychology, data, and cultural context in the same breath. And I'll tell you why. When I was a student, I was told in my undergraduate program, that I'm supposed to, when I'm doing counseling, I'm supposed to paraphrase. And I never understood why, because to me, paraphrasing sounded like parroting what the, what the person was telling me. I was just paraphrasing, rather parroting. And I would never understand why I had to do it until I read something in neuroscience, what spoke about PFC, prefrontal context. And it spoke about how when you label an emotion, it just frees up the space in the PFC, which is the size of six uh, cards. And it just helps you focus on some other issue that might require certain, which might be relevant at that point in time. That's the first time I realized how much I was missing science and psychology. So thank you for that. It really sounds good. And it's heartening to note that we've moved in that direction. Now, Anitita, I of course remember the question that you asked, even though I was struggling with technology here, but yeah, I do remember. So when you speak about culture and you speak about in a corporate sector, the four things that I can think of top of my head and which I read in your book through various pages as well, there are certain cultural biases that say, for example, certain uh, personality tests or IQ tests have. And in the corporate world, when we use those, we need to keep those in mind from a cultural bias perspective. And let me give an example. In Australia, if somebody says chop chop, it means do something fast. You need to be faster on something. Now, if that, those words are used in your personality profiling, Somebody in India may misinterpret chop chop in an absolutely different manner. So that's the cultural bias. I think you brought that point out in page 304 beautifully well. So that makes sense to me. There's something called as cultural syndrome as well. Um, and let me give you an example from an India context. So in India, if a lot, not the present generation, but the previous generation was brought up saying, if you make eye contact, uh, you are disrespecting adults, um, your elderly person. Um, somebody else in a different culture, um, Rekham, I'm sorry, in the Western world, uh, might look at it and say, 
आर यू ऑटिस्टिक और आर यू अ लायर और यू लैक कॉन्फिडेंस नाउ सी दो आर द कल्चरल सिंड्रोम दैट वी एज इंटरव्यूअर्स नीड टू बी वेरी केयरफुल अबाउट बिकॉज इन अ प्लेस लाइक इन एन एम एन सी यू आर इंटरव्यूइंग यूर मीटिंग पीपल फ्रॉम डिफरेंट कल्चर्स एंड यू कैंट मिस इंटरप्रेट बेसिस वॉट हैज बिन mentioned in the book which might be just theory so i love this aspect about the book that you cover these aspects as well uh there's something called as cultural variation which you also dr white dr mishra you have mentioned in your book um and i like what i like about it is um if i look at it from high context and low context culture and india is a high context culture where we believe more in relationships and things like that people tend to discuss um what's happening in their professional life uh, sometimes even to the extent what my salary is to the extent that this was my uh, rating and things like that in the western world which is a low context culture this might be interpreted as unprofessional now when we take cultural differences into account when we frame our policies these are various aspects that we do consider in the corporate world so and this is another example which i appreciate when you bring in data and culture context to it and which is what i admire about the book and the last thing that i i can think of and more in the context of covid it's become a lot more uh, dominant um are these culture bound values so um in india we were told that you can't share your family secrets you can't do self disclosures at some point in time and therefore we really struggled when we said that we need to have an employee assistant program which meant that you could reach out to counselors you could reach out to help if you were going through a stressful time this was an alien concept for a lot of people in india and a few things that covid has opened our eyes to and that is mental well being this is one of the things and i think this is one barrier that we are breaking at this point in time but but this but th- there is still a difference and that's called the cultural uh, bound values and then that i hope i've answered your question and thank you all so much for doing this for pearson i think it makes a huge difference in the way you've written this book partnered with us and uh, thank you all the panelists i think it made huge sense when you're talking about um culture and psychology and how this book will make a difference uh, to the undergraduate students so thank you for that thank you ritu thank and you. thanks <laughs> thank you you found your voice and we could listen to you you know this was really insightful especially the concept of mental well being yes yeah. I- <laughs> we will relate to that and thank you dr mishra also for summing up and of course ritu has said very much within the periphery of what was being discussed so i think uh, this brings us um, to the end of the session but before that it requires mention uh, of all the authors for the meticulous effort in quoting the examples in the book and also the panelists of really uh, took on this uh, challenge of actually going to the book and understanding and endorsing the ideas presented which are unique to the subcontinent as well and i'm sure it will enable students to prepare well for their careers uh um, well i can also see a lot of questions pouring in from the audience but due to paucity of time uh, and the technological challenges that we have in between uh, we shall not be able to take them up in this live session however we shall try and get back to you uh with answers to the questions after the book launch uh but there is one imperative question and i really can't miss out on that and that's for dr white uh dr white there are many students in the forum uh who would really want to know what are the emerging career options in psychology if you can just quickly uh, give us um, an answer to this <laughs> um and that in is a challenge the one thing that i want a student coming out of my class and any class in psychology i hope whether it be through the book or through their discussions with their faculty that they can see themselves doing psychology or using psychology so whether it be going into advanced study and maybe seeking masters and doing hr or doing personal counseling or going for further study for doctorate and uh, postdoc and doing research or teaching in a university regardless if a student is taking psychology i hope they will see that they will use psychology in whatever career they have or 
whether it be in their relationships at home, whether somebody is a homemaker, you will use psychology regardless of where you go and understanding that there's value. Right. Thank you, Dr. White. I think that quite answers. Um, and now with this, we come to the end of today's wonderful event to mark the beginning of a journey of the much awaited uh, book, Psychology Indian Edition. To know more such interesting and intriguing insights in psychology, grab your copies. The book is also available on Flipkart and Amazon. With that, I would like to thank everyone for being with us and gracing the event. Stay safe and maintain social distancing. Take care and good night. Mm -hmm.